Hello, I'm Blade Boquest, and this is going to be episode three of the Blade Edge Peak Performance Consulting. Can't believe I can get through that full name with this straight face. Anyway, it's basically some Black Desert coaching, and this time it's about Xbox, so it's pretty cool. It'll be about console. You guys have really wanted a lot of stuff with console. So we had session one and session two with Umbreon, and the third session was actually not recorded. So on the second session, I kind of brought you up to speed on where he is now with uh, it being 288 AP, that's his gear, along with within a few months, people are saying, how are you getting gains this quickly? It's pretty exciting. I mean, he came to past 270 AP and uh, he still found really quick gains and an acceleration of what he already knew. So I'm glad you guys got a lot out of the first two episodes. Episode three has an Xbox player who wished to remain anonymous. So. You have my audio and you have me listening to him and considering things, but he is actually muted. I edited him out of that. So just not to give away his identity. So it's going to be just a little bit different because it's not so much a conversation, but it still goes over quite a few good things, including, I mean, best active grind spots. That's always a top question that people have. A uh, good way to use your energy, right? Best use of energy, depending on where you are in your account progression, how to use your alts effectively, things like complex workshops. I have a lot of workshop guides. Um, this is a very honed in specific kind of abstract workshop uh, tutorial for him, as well as um, just different ways you can level trading. And there's a lot of different methods. And I think one of the biggest criticisms my guides have had over the four years that I've been making them, not a lot of them, I mean, you guys have really enjoyed this stuff, but uh, one of them is whenever I show a method, people immediately say, well, that, that doesn't work now because everyone else knows about it. <laughs> well, the thing is like, you can say that maybe one or two or 10 times, but when you look at all of the guides on my channel over the last four years and you have like 140 different things that you can do, it's no longer, oh, that doesn't work because now I know what to do. You just look at what's working and every one of my guides shows how to tell if it's working or not in your current server and your current marketplace. So this is just another set of tools. Maybe some of them are very specific that you can't use today. Maybe that's the exact piece that you needed. But thanks for watching the guides, you guys. Uh, this is going to be, like I said, episode three, and it's session one with a new student. This is one of three sessions for this Xbox coaching. So the next two uploads will be specifically for this Xbox uh, person going through it. And then after that, we have two more sessions. So the whole Blade Edge program, it's not even a program, but the full Blade Edge guide series on my YouTube channel is gonna be seven episodes, and this is episode three. All right, enjoy it. Hello. Hey, dude, I'm excited for this. Good stuff. All right, man. So uh, this is going to be the first of three sessions. I think we'll probably go over a good amount of stuff here. You'll make some changes and then we'll meet next week and we'll see how you're doing there. Okay. So thanks for all the screenshots. You had a lot of pretty good information here and we got a lot to go over and a lot to change. Uh, it's all looking pretty good, man. You definitely are not a, a weak player though. So good job on the gear you've gotten. Um, so from what I can tell with your screenshots, it looks as if you um, do not grind pirates much. Are you, you're typically out there grinding Valencia more? Okay. Right. Okay. So if you're out there grinding, what are you, what are you killing primarily? Okay. Yeah, the guy has bandits. Yeah, the Basilisk price right now is uh, it's pretty solid on Xbox for sure. <laughs> That's great. Right. Uh, there's two good ways to go. I mean, if you're out there enhancing your accessories and you do just want to progress your gear, then having target-specific places to go like Crescents or Bassies are really quite good. But uh, when it comes to just straight silver per hour, um, right now, we're actually looking at pirates as being the top grind spot based off of the prices of accessories um, in Xbox. So red corals are about 30 million. So if red, yeah, so if uh, red coral earrings we're talking about, did they go that far? <laughs> How funny. Yeah, that makes sense. 
Yeah, and then you see a lot of the grinders go out to Valencia. So one of the things that happened in PC, and it's actually the same just based off of your trash loot per hour and how often you get accessories, is that Pirates actually remains a top grind spot for a very, very long time. Pretty much until Camisil is launched. So there's a couple things you're going to need to know about that. Um, number one, there is a one single specific rotation that is the best and it is called the jungle rotation. Um, have you ever gone out there and are you familiar with this? Okay, uh, do you know specifically the jungle rotation? Has anyone talked to you about? Uh, kind of. The... Kind of, yeah, so at the top of the mountain there is a solo rotation. On the other side of the mountain, there's uh, basically the highest density, not necessarily of NPCs, but the highest density of crazy jacks. Uh, yeah, Crazy Jack. Uh, as far as I know, it's just Crazy Jack. But the elite will, the elite will drop the blue coral earrings. So the way to maximize your silver would be going through a Crazy Jack rotation. Um, what I'm gonna do between to this week and next week is I'll go there and I'll film a rotation that won't be on YouTube. I'll just send it to you so you can see exactly which which areas to go to because there's a lot of like back and forth and you'll skip a couple packs to keep your highest silver rate just churning those out. And it's actually one of the best XP grinds in the game as well. Right. Yeah, it'll be soon. Right. Okay, so you want to focus on pirates over Gahas and pirates over Fogans. With the price of red coral earrings being what they are, you're probably going to expect another two to three million per hour over those two grind spots right now. Now, now Crescents and Bassy can be better or worse based off of RNG, but in general, it's going to be worse than all three of those spots. Right, okay. That's, that's solid. That's really, yeah, that's pretty good. Right. And there's nothing wrong with that. Those can be fun grinds. Those can be a good change of pace. And if you need target specific items so that you can enhance, you know, you can change it up. But when you're thinking straight silver, it's pirates. And let me go over a little bit more of the breakdown on this. So th about 33%, it's kind of like a, it's cut up into thirds. So one third of the silver you're going to be making at pirates is actually just straight silver drops with the turnins. So each turn is worth 2200 and each NPC drops one no matter what. Loot scroll doesn't matter. That's it's not affected uh, unless they change that recently, but it's always just uh, they get this one trash loot for 2k plus they just drop uh, like 500 or a thousand silver. So one th Yeah, exactly those guys. Tournament. Yeah, tournament with the stacks of course. Um, so that's one third of your silver. Your next one third of your profit from pirates will be the accessories. And that's going to be in enlarged as long as RCEs are over 10 million. Like, even if they're, I mean, even if they're like 12 mil or whatever, as long as they're over 10 million, that's still your top grind spot in the game. Unless, I mean, there's really, it would have to be like Serips are 50 million. Or something absolutely crazy or if you're over 250 AP and you're grinding something like Pila Koo, but that's not relevant right now so you should be thinking pirates um, the the last 30% comes from tr selling trade coins okay so for this you're gonna need artisan 2 trading which I know you've already kind of started to work on um, and are you aware of how to actually get the buff whenever you are doing trading <laughs> where the quest starts it's funny I don't even know that I'd never quest but uh, once you do the quest it's just a one-time thing and you'll be certified to do it at that point you'll have to go out to the sharing node and then you invest 100 energy at that point and then that 
Mm -hmm. That's one hour, and it'll give you a 50% increase on everything you sell in Valencia. So basically what you want to do is make sure that um, you're, you're trading. Well, it doesn't have to be on a main. You could do a trading alt, but it should most likely be on your main. Right. Exactly. So that brings me to the next thing. Okay, right. So there are a, there are several really good trash crates. So trash crates are generally um, just anything that you are not going to be able to effectively use for more profit later. So I would actually steer away from iron. So copper is going to be your ideal, like your perfect quintessential. That's the best that you can do because you have such an abundance in the economy. There are so many more copper nodes and so f uh, s just such fewer options with copper. You'd want to use that over iron. But there are other ones. So the other ones would actually be crops, believe it or not. So if you look at the prices on Xbox, you'll see that things like potatoes and corn are actually uh, sometimes below the copper. So let me double check that here. So I, yesterday I went through the price of every single item on Xbox to make sure that we were completely good to go with current knowledge. Um, so your, your three big trash crates would be copper. It would be one of the crops that people aren't selling as much. You don't want to do multiple crops. You want to focus on ones, you know, different crate types. And then actually silver azalea. Yeah. Do you have a notebook, by the way? Great, okay. Happy to hear that. So yeah, just put down uh, the, these notes under, under passive income. So we're gonna go over the income types here. But uh, let me double check. So if we go into materials. Yeah, it's in the 200 range, right? Right. Copper is 600. Four hundred last night. Okay, so I'm looking at the wheat prices right now. Wheat, potato, all that. Ignore, ignore wheat, potatoes, corn. It's still too early in the economy for those to drop. So we won't do any of those. But you'll want to focus primarily on silver azalea. So the way trading XP works is it does not matter the value of your crate. It doesn't make any difference at all. So you can have a crate worth fifty thousand or worth two thousand, and you get the exact same XP. What it's based off of is the distance traveled. So really when you're mass producing these things, you just crank out a whole bunch of blackstone powder. Uh, you can buy it and make it yourself be the one. And then you just want to make as many of these as you can. Now write down that you'll need 15,000 to go from uh, where actually it's zero to artisan two. So you might, you might need like 14,000 or something, but having a few extra trade levels is generally a good thing. So shoot for 14, 15,000 of these crates. You also want to change where you're making them. So Trent is perfect for for ore. You can just keep going with uh, with copper ore there. Um, if you want to, it's a personal preference. Like if you feel like you're already really invested, you have your 200 crates. If you don't want to swap to copper right now and you want to finish out iron for one full batch, you can do that because the prices are similar. But long term going forward, you said you're going to be playing this game for a long time. You want to basically make copper instead. It just has fewer uses down the line. 7,137, I think it is. So you basically, after 7,000, you just kind of taper it off. That's how many you can stack on one horse. All right, so your other two locations for making these trash crates will be Calpheon and Ephyria. So you have approximately the same distance um, because what you're going to need to do is take them all the way to Arahaza. You will not sell these in Valencia. Right, so max distance out there. And this will take a while. Now, people make the mistake of trying to grind trade XP actively. 
this is a big mistake. You're basically foregoing your grinding hours, you're foregoing other actions that's gonna get you contribution energy and silver, while basically setting up something so that eventually you can then turn things in. It's a, it's a problem. You just wanna do this passively over the next month, and then when it happens, it happens, so you don't use any extra time. So what I suggest, just keep, mm -hmm. yep, yeah, exactly. Because pirates right now will actually be better than the other two grinds right now. Um, and then so without the coins, it's only just slightly worse. You're still going to be making a lot of money from accessories and from the straight silver drops. So exactly, which is it's going to keep that up there. Yeah, people really think the newer areas are the way to go and it's just not. We've done so many calculations on this with PC players, you know, we've done countless trials. Um, so what you'll want is to have, I would say, uh, two crop creators, so two of the uh, one contribution crop trade crates in Calpheon, one in Etheria, and then you can just do the minerals and Trent, that would work. You want to have two in Calpheon. You want, you want to get those going. Yeah, so this way you'll have four different workers manufacturing these. Now, uh, for the, yeah, I would, yeah. And actually those might be called herb crates. They should be, yeah. So you'd want to search for the, the herb crates, not the crop exactly. Now, whenever you're making a trash crate, it requires at uh, artisan level five to six minutes to finish. It's very, it's very fast, yeah. So you'd be focusing on giants only. So you want to get four artisan giants for these, uh, these things. It'll take you a long time to get these artisans. Doesn't matter. You aren't going to be spending your energy doing this. You want to just kind of slowly promote them, because your energy has a very high value right now. So don't, don't waste a lot of energy on this stuff. I actually grabbed blue and even green workers because they level up very quickly with trash crates and you can promote them and just fire them if they don't eventually become what you want. So just think of like a very slow, if it takes you four months to get these workers, that's good enough, it's fine. But uh, you know, just make them with whatever you can in the next month or so, you should be able to get Artisan 2 pretty easily. All right, good. So that was an important aspect where we wanted to go over with that aspect of passive plus your grind area. Um, as for, let's talk about energy right now. So you're spending it a lot of different ways. Uh, let me pull up your screenshots one more time. When's the last time you gathered water from the river? Yeah. Well, right, right, okay. Um, so if you look at the market, you'll see that the reagents right now are about 1,000 silver or so. Now they can cap out at uh, 2,500, and right now there's a huge abundance of those on the, on the market. And it'll probably be like that for several months. The reason is because that's your intro into alchemy. So people are basically power leveling these things. Because of that, you'll basically want to never gather river water again. It's just not worth your energy at all. The only useful thing of gathering river water yourself is that you can do it AFK, and so it gives you a very minimal amount of gathering XP over a long period of time, but it's there's so many better things to do AFK, you just want to sell all of your bottles and not worry about it anymore. Uh, so what you will want to do with energy is gather pine sap, actually. Yeah. So are you aware of the pine sap market? Do you know its price or why it's valuable? Okay, so when I was going through this, the reason we're doing pine sap is because of the current state of the Xbox economy. So what you gather down the road in a few months will probably change. But pine sap right now is 6,000 a piece. And you can easily get over 2K an hour, which actually puts it up there with in my opinion, just above grinding <laughs> because you have sharps and hards as well. So your primary source of income will actually be gathering pine sap first and then when you have no more energy to spend, you'll be working on your pirates 
and then other other things we'll set up in, in the future here so the okay so there are two different strategies um actually yeah we'll talk about that next real quick uh with just how to do it so are you aware of the easy way to get five gathering yeah all right so at least yeah that's fine doesn't matter how you get it you can get it that easily without having to pop work or elixirs you'll be good oh that's perfect dude so you're gonna get this is this is gonna be more money than than grinding for you and you just sell it straight to the market just sell all the saps straight to the market you don't need to use it for anything what's keeping the market high right now is people building those fishing boats and that will taper off but as long as pine sap is over 4k a piece this is still gonna beat your your pirate grind when you start seeing it in mid 3k a piece then you want to start uh, at least grinding more than gathering you still want to gather for its own sharps and hards but you'd want to prioritize grinding over gathering at that point okay um what do you know about magic and lucky tools yeah good okay so then that's simple perfect exactly yeah, it's a huge waste to ever, ever gather without lucky tools. So you're just going to mass produce those fluid extractors. So you asked if you should level up your alts. So there are two different strategies here, and it's based off of how long you want to play. Now, the first strategy is you have your main and you have whatever your that is, and you just go ahead and take all the energy on your alts and you convert it into potions and you transfer it over your main and your main keeps on gathering. So the advantages of this is that your main is going to get the majority of the gathering XP or all of the gathering XP. It'll level up the most. And when you have a high gathering level, it actually does a couple different things. It reduces how often you use the durability of your magic tools. I don't know if you knew that. Yeah, so that's one advantage. It also... Uh, you have one in your bank. Right. Oh, that's always the only way. Oh, well, actually, you can get the seals to turn in, yeah. But almost all the magic tools on PC come from those events. They just flood the market. Yeah, we all buy them, and then so... So you should be able to at least get a couple. Um, but anyway, so magic or lucky tools, uh, either way, with a higher gathering level, it reduces the chance to actually consume durability, and that's very important. Right. The other thing it does is when you gather, you actually will uh, just consume energy less often. You knew that too? Okay, great. So so that's the advantage of having one, one character that does that. Now, there is a problem, though. The problem is you take 200 energy, which is generated over the course of several days on an alt, and you convert that to 50 energy. So you're always getting basically 25% less energy. I mean, 25% of what you could have in terms of energy, but if it's all channeled through a high gather, artisan into master and things like that, you're going to get more out of your energy, so it basically evens out. So here's what you need to decide. If you wanna have the most benefit in the next three to six months, you pour all of your energy into one character. If you wanna have basically the best potential account and empire set up uh, within six months to a year to two years, you wanna do it the way I did it, which is all of your characters go out there to Pilgrim's Haven and they're out there with lucky pickaxes and they're going to be just doing stuff until they have skilled five. And then actually, yeah, it's skilled five. Actually, hang on, let me explain this a little bit better. Um, so, well, beginner 10, you're going to be able to use those lucky steel tools and sturdy extractors. But um, with Pilgrim's Haven, it's going to just get your XP the highest for gathering XP. Um, so really, I said skill five. That's when you can start getting the gems, which is when the XP pops. But all of my characters stayed out there until actually Artisan one gathering. So this is the very long-term approach. The reason this works so well is because eventually you actually have more energy than you can really ever deal with because you have, you know, all energy on all of your characters that you can cycle through. And when it comes to a sharp and hard event, 
There are many times when gathering is going to be the best income in the game hands down, and you'll want to gather continuously. So if all of your characters are artisan and above, not only are they going to get the most amount of procs, like at that point they, you can start getting 4 pine sap, for example, whereas lower levels you'd be capped at 3, and then in skilled you'd be capped at only 2. So there's a reason to get your all of your characters high gathering. Um, but then you can just basically do it continuously with a camisil buff and it'll be the best income potential in the game Where if one person has a main character, they will run out of energy So it's up to you on how you want to do that Yep, oh yeah, yeah Exactly, so that works really really well. That's a very effective thing um, You'll just need to think about it and decide if you would rather you don't have to take all your alts out to Pilgrim's Haven, it's just going to bring them to Artisan the fastest. And honestly, within you know the first few months of this server launching, it's not necessary that you grind all of your alts to Artisan. You could have them all gathering Pine Sap, and that's going to be very beneficial. The problem is with lower gathering level, they don't get as much Pine Sap, and it's not as much XP by any margin as Pilgrim's Haven would be. So do you think you have a preference now on, on which strategy you'll use? Yeah, that's a, yeah, that's a good idea. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, you can still continue that. Right, that's a good idea. I have one in Valencia too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you don't want to do that. Cool. Cool, yeah, that's a good strategy. Right, exactly. Yeah, that'll be really effective later on too um, when we get into alchemy. Because we're, we're gonna go for some of that as well. Uh, so to get the pirate node, it's gonna cost you six CP. So just make sure you get that and then you'll wanna start leveling it up. It is better at 10. Oh no, oh no, I've done that too, okay. Right, yeah. Oh, that sounds bad. Right, and that probably wasn't the crazy jack rotation either. That's that's what does it too. Right, so I'll at some point film myself running out there and I'll show you exactly where those go. Um, do you know how node level and loot chance works? <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, it's easy to use that as evidence, right? Yeah, so here's how it works. We've all had that experience on PC and we actually went back and forth. Um, eventually, tests were done to the point where the entire community believed that nodes didn't make the slightest difference. It was kind of bizarre because it's just hard to get really good gather. It does say it does, yeah. So essentially what happens is at a level 10 node, every 10th time you kill an NPC type, you have a 50% increased drop rate on all items. 
So what that averages out to is 5% with a level 10 node, which means it is effective, it is useful, but it's not very noticeable one way or another, so it shouldn't be the top priority for your energy. So at some point you would... Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. <laughs> right, okay. Cool. So, yeah, you will eventually want to grind with a level 10 node. I mean, I don't know how many thousands of hours I spent out of Pirates, but over the course of, you know, until we eventually get Camusild on Xbox, uh, that is going to be the top. Yeah, we'll see. You never know. Right. Mm-hmm. All right, so let's see here. Cool, good stuff. Yes, that's very true. All right, so I still got about like 40 good notes here of little tweaks we're gonna make. We're halfway through the first session, so I wanna actually make sure you understand the five categories of income before we go further. Um, so, with your notes, you have a passive income section, hopefully. Make another section called interval income. And then make another one called opportunistic income. So with active income, that's the first type, but you don't even really need to write it down. It's just simply anything that you're taking time and you're spending your time and energy actually playing, that's your active income. Active income can be most things, and some forms of active income can become passive income. Uh, things like for cooking, I actually, I will actively cook as I stream. That's a form of active income. Gathering, active income. Grinding, active income. It's just something that you choose to do in the game. You know, it doesn't really matter. So you probably don't need to define that. It's fairly obvious. Um, now, passive income, so your trade crates right now will just be getting you to the, the level where you can start making money uh, from active income, but later on eventually you'll be making Calpheon crates and Medaya crates out of Trent and then eventually out of Grana. So that's going to be your form of passive income. So with the trading leveling that you were already doing, that probably wasn't for pirates, it doesn't seem like that was so much on your radar, so was that eventually to be a trader setup? Good. Okay, I think that's a wise decision. Cool. Okay. So eventually the way it'll work is once you have Artisan 2, um, processing AFK, just taking things from Tier 1, Tier 2, Tier 3, Birch, Fur, and Calpheon, those are the three timbers that go into this Calpheon crate, you're probably going to see from start to finish, assuming you already have your levels, probably in the range of 8 to 10 million an hour from processing, uh, which is actually quite good. The problem is then you'll be processing for like, you know, one and a half or two hours, depending on your carry weight. So if you're, once you're set up like that, if you're overnight processing for trade crating, you will be making more money than fishing. So later on, it does become a very, very solid form of passive income. Yeah, and that's not a problem at all. So especially with the long cook times, you know, that is kind of something that you'd need to do. Oh, plus four? Right. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, I see that you've been doing that, so that seems that seems pretty good. The prices are too high to buy them, so you're correct to make your own there. 
In fact, it would be pretty profitable to make and sell them even after, after you get yours. Good. <laughs> yeah, it really is. Right. Nice. Okay, cool. Um, so let's see. So let's still work on the, before we hit passive income any harder here, let's talk about some more interval income. What do you do with bosses? How often are you killing the bosses that are up? Cool. Okay. <laughs> That's awesome. All right. So whenever the boss gear is even around like in the eighties to 90 millions running bosses, it can be one of the better forms of income, even on PC. It generally, they don't take very long to kill. You have a good chance of getting loot and so forth. On Xbox, it's gonna take a little bit longer as well, but your prices are higher. So you have boss gear running at, you know, 250 million. So it actually still ends up being worth your time to hit every boss in the game. Except for Mudster, that's the one to avoid. Exactly. Yeah, those are useless. So what you'll want to do is actually build two boss alts, and ideally they will be level 56 with 100 AP. And that's not that hard to get, and it'll pay for itself within a week or so. Well, maybe two weeks. Okay. Okay, cool. So that would need to be uh, one of your boss alts to basically hang around the Kudum Sanctuary and then run out to Nuver. And then, you know, your other one would just stay around the Zarka and be able to hit Begs, Red Nose, and then uh, obviously you don't have Karanda yet, but Karanda will be on the Delphi Knight's Castle Ridge. So that's all in the same area. So two separate boss alts, and you want to make that your top priority. So interval income is essentially burst of income that is very effective to get when you can get it, but you can't repeat it indefinitely. So going further on interval income would be workshops. Um, we're going to need to redo almost everything with your nodes, <laughs> uh, which, which is good. Okay. Uh, cool. Okay. So one thing you'll want to know is that you shouldn't have these cities connected. Uh, each city should have its own little hub and then the workers should go out from there and then bring all your, their guys back. And you don't really want to connect any of these nodes until right before you do a trade in and no other time. Right. Okay, so that's a good point you bring up. So transport, you know how it says the price will be tripled if you don't have your nodes connected? It's actually showing you the tripled price. So it's nothing at all. It's absolutely nothing, yeah. So you'd never, you'd never have to connect your nodes to avoid that price. It's practically free. Exactly. Yeah, before you turn in pirate coins, yeah, so you'll be great there. And then obviously before you do the, the uh, trash turn-ins over at Arahaza, and then in the distant future, your Calpheon and Medaya crates when you're turning those in Valencia for money. Cool. All right, let's see here. What else do I got for you? Uh, so there's another form of, of interval income. I want to stick to that for a little bit, which would be workshops. So I want to introduce a couple workshops to your system. Let's see. Let me look at this on PC real quick. So how familiar are you with Manos crafting? You do have it, yeah. On the broker. What what broker? Oh, the central market? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Oh, I gotcha. I thought you meant night vendor. I was like, is that there? All right, so there's one workshop in particular that is very easy to keep going and it's very profitable and it'll actually be um, just one of your best sources of income going forward and that is the Altanova 5.8 Manos Jeweler. So go ahead and uh, it's going to be 11 contribution. 
So whatever it is that you need to uninstall to have that, you're good to go. Cool. Um, well, actually, you'll need that too. So the five star jeweler is four or five. So that's 11 contribution for the jeweler and then 11 contribution for the Manos as well. Right. So, so the way this works, it's a little bit bizarre, but it's definitely good to have. So rubies are easy to get because they come from the coal node in Omar Lava Cave in Altanova. So you would basically do something like make a batch of five standard ruby rings and then uh, later on you'd have to make a higher batch of like five resplendent ruby rings stuff like that uh, moving on to blood ruby earrings so you actually make each tier going up five tiers you see how that works right okay so there's only one particular one that you'd make out of all of this um, and that would be the ruby earrings. So the reason this is so effective is because ruby earrings are a 15 DP earring. And if you're selling them at minimum price, which is 12 million, you're coming away with generally between one and two million profit. There are very few in the market and they're selling at 15 million. So this would be pretty much a five hour cycle to get an additional five to six million. So you'd be able to generate an additional million an hour. But as long as you have these two workshops running and you can you know, run them overnight, you can make a big batch of things like that. You can essentially get about an extra million an hour for 24 hours a day from then on. Now the regular jeweler is going to make the stage five corrupt ruby earrings. Right, mm-hmm. Uh, you wouldn't actually be gathering. So the nice thing about the workshop setup, at least the way I like to do it, is that you're buying these things straight off of the market. So it doesn't take any additional active time at all. So we find, we find things where we can buy all the components and then just run them through the system and all we have to do is list them. So it really just becomes interval income because you're able to you know, check on those sales and then list a couple more a few times a day and then just wait to collect them. It'd be nice to do it indefinitely, but it never works like that. So if you keep a steady production until you have like, I mean, if you have a surplus of like 50 of these, you could probably slow down. Um, they won't sell quickly, but they will consistently sell. And even at minimum price, you're making good profit. Yeah, for each of them. Yeah. Yeah, you want regular exactly on both of those. Uh, so if you're looking at, yeah, so you can buy rough rubies right on the market. I'm looking at them now. Rough rubies, there's 500 in the market, they're min price. Standard rubies, there's 11,000 in the market, so you can get those. Um, blood rubies, you can just straight up buy those. They're 450K and that's worth buying. Do you know the ratios behind processing all these or no? It's a little weird for jewels. I can go over them. Okay, so uh, with processing, it would take five rough rubies to make a standard ruby. It would take 10 standard rubies to make a resplendent ruby. And it actually takes uh, seven resplendent rubies to make blood rubies. And then with the resplendent rubies, you need seven resplendent rubies, plus you need gem polisher. And I think, I think it's three, I forget the, I think it's three though. Um, to make the top tier blood ruby, yeah. And the ratios, yeah, it's not worth making them. You can just buy them because other people are like, hey, this is something I can do. So you can buy them from the other people that are making them for us. Um, and then the ratios of what you would get from those, whenever you're producing rubies, you get on average 2.5 with a high level processor and you have a high enough level processor. Um, with resplendent rubies, you'd make on average 2.5. Whenever you're taking seven resplendent rubies and making blood rubies, you would only get 1.5 on average out of it. So 
It's worth having the node, yeah. I mean, coal is good enough to have the node on its own. So what that would mean is with resplendent rubies, so if it's seven times uh, 40 there, so you're looking at 2,800, I'm sorry, 280,000. And then uh, gem polisher, I think is around 60 some K. You would still profit if you had to make your own blood rubies, but it's not worth your time. You can easily just grab, grab the things already made. Now the next thing you're gonna need is a vanadium crystal. Yeah, go ahead. Let me see. So the Manos necklaces require mithril. Let me check what how many earrings are. They were max price without a huge amount before. There's 10 of them there. So a total of 100 have sold. So 100 have sold and there's 10 listed, which shows a pretty low demand, to be honest. In the next week, try to produce five. So a nice, simple, easy, easy thing. And then after you produce five, um, oh yeah, we'll go from there and we can communicate throughout the week. So let me know once you make five. Uh, Vanadium, I believe. Let me double check. Yeah, it's a pure Vanadium crystal. You need three of them. Let's see what the prices are on those. And there are ways to get them outside of actually processing them if people aren't selling them. We'll find out in a second, though. So there's vanadium shards on the market. Uh, there are not many vanadium crystals. I would just put a buy order out for uh, 15 vanadium crystals. Uh, yeah. So you can get them with using metal solvents on vanadium ingots. Other than that, it's melting. I believe it's Rosar. Fairly confident. Yeah, fairly sure. Uh, you know what, I'll, let me buy a couple right now. We'll just see what that does. Because Rosar is either going to give titanium crystals or vanadium crystals. I can't remember, but we'll figure it out. Is that part of the uh, corrupt ruby? There you go. All right, so I just grabbed 10 of them. I'll start melting them and see what we get. Another workshop you're going to want to have is fishing rods. Have you ever made these before? Perfect, okay. So fishing rods are basically one of the best forms of workshop income right now. Oh, you were making them yourself. It's worth it to buy the crystals, generally, yeah, rather than make them yourself. Uh, I'll do the math here in a sec. Alright, so I'm melting down some Rosars real quick. Uh, but yeah, so let's look at fishing rods real quick. So, life tools, fishing tools. So all these guys are over, over a million, which is fantastic. Except for Balanos, it's a little bit less. Uh, so Furia doesn't tell you how many are listed at what price on Xbox, right? That's unfortunate. <laughs> That's really unfortunate. Um, Alright, so if you're making Calpheon fishing rods, it takes lead crystals. If you're making Medaya, it takes zinc crystals. If you're making Etheria, I believe it's copper crystals, and then Balanos, I think, is iron crystals, but those last two might be reversed. Either way, so say you're making a fury rods or something so we're looking at what 1 million 80k pull up a calculator real quick so 1.08 times 
you, you know the tax percentage, right? 0.845, okay. So the silver you're getting back is 910k. So far, so good. And then see what these crystal prices are. So in the ore section, we got. So copper crystals are 100k. 10 crystals, by the way, are useless. If you ever get those things, just can't really do anything with them. Zinc, even zinc crystals are really cheap. I mean, these zinc crystals are 130k. That's not expensive. So the reason this stuff isn't expensive when it looks like it's expensive is because you don't have to put in any work. You don't have to get the savagery. You're not doing alchemy. You're not doing any of that stuff. You're just straight up buying the things, right? So uh, these crystals, I believe it's copper. So we're just going to deduct 500k there. You're coming away with between uh, 300 and 400k profit. Now, an artisan worker can make one of these in a half an hour. So if you can make an extra 300, 400K profit every half an hour, this is even gonna supersede your, your Manos earring workshop. But the, but the reason it's really effective to have that Manos is because there will be a time when people will buy them like hotcakes. And if you practice now making them, even if right now there aren't a ton being sold and it is a high contribution, if you can basically flip the switch and say, okay, now's my chance, you can actually get to the point where you can start selling like over 100 within a day or two. And it, it becomes so effective. Yeah, I have uh, one of my old guildmates in Exceptional Legion use that one method because he saw me doing it on stream and did only that, nothing else, and like came away with so many billions it shocked me when he's like, yeah, I'm the sole, sole provider of Manos earrings on the server. And I was like, dude, I totally forgot about that market. That's great. So, uh, the fishing rod one, you want most of your manufacturing done out of Calpheon. Yeah, so that will be the most effective in terms of contribution um, and then just having workers, cheap lodging, all of that good stuff. How's your storage doing right now? With like, is it expanded very far? Right, okay. Uh, so you said your budget is roughly 300 or so a month, which is a really high effective budget. You're gonna be able to get everything and more you'll need, right, for that. So what you would wanna do is uh, basically pretty soon, maybe not before it's necessary, but you wanna start thinking about maxing your storage and Calpheon, probably Heidel, and then maybe Altanova as well. So that way you can, I mean, if you have an Altanova cap storage, you can have waves of these these earrings you can make 20 of one kind and then you can just say all right make 20 at another time or of the next kind and you know that that'll be 10 hours so you can go to sleep and you can come back with 20 of the next stage and then set it up for the following yeah so like making those in altanova if you have a max storage you can just keep a whole bunch of different uh stages and it'll just oh oh we're talking about both so calpheon max your storage is that's one thing and then max it in altanova and heidel all th all three of those should be really good um i don't think you have the pearl lodging yet right do you okay great all right yeah exactly Level three. Mm-hmm. Uh, all right, so, oh man. Unfortunately, we're already running out of time. Dang, I've got so much more to tell you. Let's go over nodes. I want your node system to be set up by today. All right, let me swap monitors here. Grab the screenshots again so I can see what you got. You're familiar with specialty nodes, right? Okay, great. So you have the specialty node of Lynch Farm Ruins right now. You're going to need a lot more. There are tons of them, and they're all very, very good. Yeah, in a, in a way. Right. 
Yeah, everything was price capped at like 10k a piece, so you could never buy anything, which made it even more useful to have them because then you could use the traces and stuff. So, um, one of the ones, just if we go top down, is the Ancient Stone Chamber. So the Ancient Stone Chamber is going to give you Trace of Earth and Trace of Ascension. And what, what you'll want to do is stockpile the Trace of Earth because that's going to go through Alchemy. And we'll go through that on next week's session, what Alchemy recipes are important and how to get you there. But make sure you have that. So you already have Lynch Farm Ruins, right? Alright, good. Uh, I see you went up and you got one birch node at B tree ruins. Um, that's fine. That's perfect. The node before that is called Berniato farm. See it? You already have the overarching node, right? So what you do is you go there and talk to the node manager and invest 35 energy and it'll open up the excavation. So you need to do that on all of these specialty nodes, it's the only way to get them. And that gives you Trace of Forest. So Trace of Forest right now is about 50k a piece on Xbox. Uh, now there are, there are two good ways of using it. So one of the good ways of using it is by making gathering costumes. The other good way is making farming costumes. Alright, so if we go south of Calpheon, there's another Trace of Forest node. Uh, it's called Rua Tree Stub. Yep. Um, no, it's on, so you have Bear, north of Bear is Bear downstream, and then it's one node to the east. You had to connect it probably before you got the Hex Sanctuary. See it? Yep, so that's another specialty node. You're going to go talk to that node manager, 35 energy, open it up. And you can really just stockpile these things. So with interval income, again, that's just what it is. You get these income in batches, you get the income in intervals. So as you stockpile these trace of forest, uh, you know, you can go two, three, four weeks or something and say, okay, I'm going to flip the switch. I'm going to get all my income back. I'm going to, at this point, get a costume mill, just run it in Calpheon and make whichever one's more profitable, either gathering or farming costumes. Right now, farming costumes are 900K a piece. So if you're spending, like, and then your opportunity cost, if you were to buy these traces, it would be about 50k a piece. You're getting them for free, which is even better. Um, but that's how you would judge if you should sell the Trace of Forest or if you should use them. If you just uh, calculate buying cost of Trace of Forest, right, that makes sense. All right, there's more to get. Um, so you aren't going to get this one, but I'm going to tell you about it. So the Mancha Forest is another of the excavation nodes. So by the time I'm done with you, you're going to be one of the best alchemists on the server, ready to profit at every future stage of the game. And that's a lot of the stuff that we're going to go over the next session. Yeah, dude, there's... Oh, man. <laughs> right. Oh, yeah. Yeah, dude. That's what this game is built for, so you just need to have the right empire, you'll be good to go. So why this is important, just put it in your notes so you're aware of this or memorize this. So Trace of Forest, oh, I'm sorry, not Trace of Forest, Mancha Forest node excavation gives you Trace of Violence. Trace of Violence is one of the best traces in the entire game because it is the bottleneck behind making a draft elixir that will eventually be produced. Right. Yeah, you don't have it yet, and Trace of Forest, or tra sorry, Trace of Violence is sitting on your market for 6k a piece. Now, it's not really worth investing at this stage, but you should be aware of it because there will be a time, and we can talk, like, you know, as there's expansions, we can just talk for free or whatever you can say, you know, this is going to be happening, and I can look at the quantities and see if it makes sense to buy out the market or not. But you don't, you don't need the node now, just be aware of it. 
Bogans and Nagas. Oh no, that's that's savagery now, it's something else. Yeah. That's a good idea. Pila Ku, I think, drops violence. Alright, so another node you do need is Glitch Ruins. So Glitch Ruins gives you Trace of Origin. Now, Trace of Origin is very important for you right now, because basically uh, next week when we meet, you're going to be using that uh, in order to get Gem Polishers. So the way this is going to work is it takes uh, only two traces, so you can buy it on the market, and you should buy it on the market as often as you can. So it's like 20, 20k or something for Trace of Origin. The other recipe parts are not that, not that bad, and you can get gem polishers and those things are 60k a piece. So that'll just be a staple of your alchemy profit. Uh, Alright, so the other excavation node you need is Ancient Ruins Excavation Site. That is uh, north of the Camisilf Temple. Okay, so you should have Ancient, Stone Chamber, Lynch Farm Ruins, Berniato Farm, Rua Tree Stub, Glish Ruins, and that Ancient Ruins Excavation. Uh, two Traces, Chaos, and Trace of Earth, but Trace of Earth is why it's valuable. The other interesting thing about excavation is that they always drop a whole bunch of vendor trash loot. You just sell it straight to the vendor and it always pays for the beer plus more, so it's good passive income there. But those traces of earth are 50k a piece, and three of them goes into plywood hardeners. Plywood hardeners on Xbox are 130-140k to a piece, so that's going to be another staple of your alchemy later on. Yeah. Right. Mm hmm Yeah, it's not too bad to maintain those right now. So you want to make sure all of your cities are disconnected. The workshops you should have... Uh, actually, let's see here. You know what, let's grab a couple more nodes. How much DP do you have left? Right, right, right. Okay, so you're gonna need five more nodes. Write them down, because we're uh, starting to run out of time here. So these five nodes are gonna end up giving you black crystals, rough black crystals. The first one is, yes, you do have a couple. So the first one is Abandoned Iron Mine. That's an easy one. I think that's the one you have. Um, the next one is down in Basham Base, actually. That's a little known one. But Basham Base has rough black crystals there. You absolutely have to make sure you get that. It's one of the best nodes in the game. You have two down by Crescent Mountains. I believe you have the nodes, or did you just invest it to grind? Okay, so you you can keep that because you're going to need Crescent Mountains. Crescent Mountains has two rough black crystal nodes. You got to get them. They're they're amazing, dude. So the rough black crystals on Xbox are going for uh, 17k a piece. And then the uh, processed versions are going for, I think, 45k a piece. So, yeah, is that nuts? Yeah. So that's going to be a major... So we've actually already run over our hour. I'm just going to give you a few more minutes because I want to make sure this is set up for next week. Yeah, no problem. Uh, yeah, so with those rough black crystals, to be honest, it's not even worth your processing time. If you do the math, just sell them as rough and you'll be good to go. So that's just straight passive income. Every time you get one of those, it's 17k and you'll get a lot of them. You also want to get the Pilgrim's Haven node. Pilgrim's Haven node has rough black crystals. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it hasn't been too crazy. I was a little surprised that the prices are as low as they are. I think a lot of people are prepared. Right. 
Okay, cool. So just real quick summary. So you're going to invest in the pirate node. That's going to be your primary place to grind. You want to spend your energy as often as you can. You're going to be getting pine sap only harvesting with lucky and magic tools. Your workshops are going to be an herb crate out of Ethereum, two herb crates in Calpheon, fishing rods. So Balanos, Ethereum, Calpheon, and Medaya. You're going to rotate through manufacturing them, maybe make five of each type, sell some, make five of the next type. But keep that workshop running until you know your bank's overflowing and then stop that. Uh, you're going to have the, you can continue iron if you want to, but eventually swap it over to copper and Trent. And you're going to start learning how to do the Manos earrings uh, with the 22 contribution out of Altanova. So you, you don't have to get this done by next week, but start working on two characters up to 56 that are going to be 100 AP that can be on both bosses. Make sure you don't miss a single boss if you can help it, you know, as long as you're not working or something. And then the next thing I need to do is get a, a level 25 or level 30 alt that has about 50 AP, which should be really easy to do. And then we'll go over more next week. Yeah. All right, man, how you feeling about all this so far? Cool, good stuff. Yeah, it really is. But this will help a lot. And I got a lot more to tell you. Mm -hmm. That's great. Right, buying a try is, is a good choice. Oh yeah, I agree. Slow and steady, that definitely, definitely works. So, all right, cool. If you have any extra contribution, just grab things that are centrally located around um, whatever city like Veli or Heidel. Grab some lodge and get some workers there. Eventually you'll wanna have most of those workers and those nodes filled. So that's where your extra should go, if you have any. Yeah, yeah, keep cooking for AFK stuff right now. That'll work. All right, man. Let's, uh, let's, does this time work for you next week? Okay, great. I'm busy Thursdays. I've, I've got stuff. Okay. <laughs> um, Oh, we are getting, oh wait, we are getting Awakening. Oh crap, I have the official Pearl Abyss stream on Friday then. Uh, well, we'll coordinate something, we'll, we'll be in touch. Right, but uh, they have streamers basically go over things. I think I'm scheduled for Friday, I'll have to double check. Yeah, actually I do, <laughs> I do think so. They haven't said anything about it, but yeah, I think we can expect Ronda with Awakening, that makes sense. So have that boss all ready to go, that'll be important. All right, man. I'll talk to you in Discord. We'll coordinate our next time. And uh, yeah, looking forward to hearing what you can what can you do and all this stuff. Absolutely. No problem, dude. Talk to you later.